All right, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, pots and trays, you know, it was a very general um, uh, brief to, to, to try and uh, fulfill in the time that we've got available, about 45 minutes. Um, and the thought that I had was that um, maybe we just discuss a little bit about what we're missing with pots and trays and some of the experience that I've drawn from visiting overseas exhibitions and spending more time than is generally healthy on eBay, um, looking at, at different pots and, and the, the different pots that are available. Um, so if we advance, there we go. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we are missing uh, in South Africa. Uh, this is a, a potter called Deju. He's from uh, Japan. I haven't been able to find much information about him, but I think he was active in the 1970s, largely, 70s and early 80s. Um, I've got a few of his pots, um, but I just find them absolutely beautiful. He, you know, I think he's really one of my favorite potters um, because the, the detail that he puts into the um, uh, put, puts into the pots, um, the little rivets, these uh, the, the um, curly stuff at the top, the detail on the feet, particularly his feet. I, I just absolutely love um, the feet that he does um, on, you know, on, on Deju pots. And so this is the kind of ceramic ware that's available for bonsai um, across the world. And we are able to, to get some of these pots. We can, order, we can buy them on eBay. Uh, we can ship them into the country. It's fairly expensive, but, but you do get some really interesting containers. And um, it's important to remember though that this is a very, very small container. This is, this is about um, 10 centimeters in, in diameter. Um, so uh, then if we just look at the, the next pot and a little tree, this is, this is work from Phil Levitt um, using a Chinese pot that um, was bought from uh, Stephen at the Stone Lantern Bonsai Nursery. And again, you can see the, the pot matching is just really exquisite. It's again, a small tree. Um, but just the tree, the pot, the moss, the whole composition um, really, really works very, very elegantly. And so through the course of this talk, we'll be sort of thinking about some of the, the processes that are needed to, to achieve a result like this. Um, I really do enjoy Bill Valavanis's um, bonsai blog. He's, uh, he often writes very insightful um, pieces about his experiences in Japan. And uh, this particular article, There's More to Bonsai Than Meets the Eye, I found particularly interesting. And it's important, you know, if, if we read through um, the text, the one key bit for me is, it is important to have respect for the tree, container, and history of the bonsai. In Japan, the history of the bonsai is important and is deeply respected. Aspects of the history of the bonsai include the origin of the tree, who grew it, how it was grown, where it was grown, who designed it, who matched the container, who displayed the tree, current and past owners. And I think this is a, an area where we often have a bit of a gap um, in that we go to exhibitions and we're all too ready to redesign trees and criticize them and say that they, you know, if, I, if this was my tree, I'd cut that branch off or do that, as opposed to just stepping back for a moment and just appreciating the tree for what it is and for what, what is being presented in front of us. Um, and I think the, the other thing is when we often look at uh, particularly Japanese exhibitions, we might, you know, we may not have the insight to appreciate what is being offered to us. And so um, we do need to be careful about being too critical of, of the displays that we see. So an example would be something like this tree. Um, you know, if, if we look at it, you know, if we're applying the rules or, you know, chatting about it, if we saw it in exhibition, we may well be quite critical of it. Um, the pot is very small, it's a peculiar pot, it's a strange tree with a rather full design, you can't really see the trunk, um, it's a funny low down branch, um, you know, there's just all sorts of oddnesses about the tree. But what we may not appreciate is that the pot that that tree is planted in was brought into Japan before 1568 and um, in, what was that, 2014, so um, you know, seven years ago, it was sold for just a shade less than a million dollars back to a Chinese collector. And so, you know, without that insight, without that knowledge, the, the tree um, seems a bit peculiar, but now, you know, just, just appreciating that history and actually taking that on board, 
um, gives us an opportunity to to really appreciate the depth of the history and and the the character that, that's being displayed uh, with this tree. Um, another experience that that I found terribly useful was actually going to the Bonsai Europa exhibition. This was in 2017, and um, it's important, you know, you know, what's interesting about getting to overseas exhibitions is that um, you, you gain insight, you gain understanding about what is happening. And when we looked at the, when I looked at the, the winning displays, they were really, really good lessons on extremely good display, um, the kinds of beautiful pots that, that, are, that are possible. I'm not sure if you can see the, the cursor that, I'm, that I've got here, but you know, you've got this exquisite little pot here, the variety of the pots on that main stand. Um, the two things in the background and the, the, the red pot are just awards that um, they received, that um, uh, Mark and Rita Cooper received for this display. Um, but it's, it's really worthwhile just studying this, looking at the combination of the pots that have been used, the colors, the shapes, um, the pot matching with the actual trees. It really is a remarkable and world class um, display. And then we look at this other tree, this is again by Mark and Rita Cooper, it got the award for best deciduous tree. Um, and again, you know, the combination of this display, uh, the accent plant, you know, very beautiful Pico pot. And um, again, you know, just the pot matching and, and, and the overall display. Um, also, you see interesting practical things like how that tree is actually transported and the way in which it's actually bolted to a board um, to protect the pot, treat the pot with, with respect, treat, you know, protect the tree, make sure it doesn't, make sure it doesn't fall over when, when they, they're driving with it back to their house. And I think this is another, th another aspect of bonsai that many of us don't do. I mean, I'm trying to do it much more now, is really look after the material. So look after the pots when we're shipping them to bonsai exhibitions. Be very careful with the stands when we're moving trees around on them. Um, all of these kinds of things, because, you know, when we start getting more precious and more beautiful um, objects, we need to, we need to treat them with care and, and attention. Uh, also had the opportunity to meet uh, Michael Ryan Bell, who um, is an American expert on um, Japanese pots. Uh, he runs the Japanese Bonsai Pots um, website, and on there is this um, uh, chop and signature resource and it's this incredible resource of thousands of images of the signatures that you get on the bottom of us and we can actually um, I, I use it frequently to actually identify um, the pots that, that, that I'm that I own or, or pots that I'm looking at on, on eBay so it was really fantastic to have the opportunity to, to talk to him I uh, also got to meet, meet uh, Thor Holvilla and, and his partner Karina Jen uh, two potters from Scandinavia, and uh, just to just to watch them working and, and see how they work with clay and what they create was was really exciting. So on the left hand side we've got um, Thor's pots and the kinds of pots that he creates. This this was before he went to Japan and, and did six months of, or four months of training in Japan. And then Karina's pots are on on my right hand side there, um, and you can just see the difference. Um, but it was just lovely to to just spend two hours watching um, a, a ceramicist, watch a potter, working with the clay, you know, creating pots in different ways. These were pinch pots um, and then this was um, block carving of, of a pot and just the way in which he casually produced pots that, that were really quite striking and quite beautiful. Um, I've never been able to actually get a, a Thor pot um, and their prices are now becoming unobtainable for, for South Africans. Um, but it's, you know, it was really fun to watch that. So, pots, bonsai pots, the exhibition pots. I think the very important and, and primary thing to remember is that um, pots need to be functional. And so what, what are the functions that, that, that bonsai pots need to provide? Um, they need to provide a suitable environment for the tree to grow in. So that's sufficient water, sufficient air. Um, temperature needs to be moderated because roots are much less tolerant to variations in temperature than uh, the top parts of the tree. And, um, and they also need a, a way to actually anchor into the ground because if the bonsai is moving all over the place when it's um, in, in the pot, 
the roots will continuously be broken and the, the tree will, will suffer and weaken. So um, those are the, the sort of the practical horticultural functions of the pot. And then there's also the very, very important aesthetic functions. And so, you know, with the aesthetics of the, of the bonsai, uh, you want to enhance the beauty of the tree. Um, the pot needs to complement the tree and, and very importantly, not overwhelm or dominate the tree when, when you're creating that display. Um, and this leads on to the, the wonderful field of pot matching and the tremendous amount of, of attention and care that, that's actually put into matching trees with pots, um, particularly in, in the East. So, I mean, this is an example of a, of a very well-matched um, pine tree in a very beautiful pot. Um, I'm not sure who made it, but it would be a very expensive um, container that uh, this pine tree has been matched with. And so all the horticultural functions are being provided for, for this tree, as well as the, the aesthetic um, component. Um, getting to South African trees, you know, this is a, a very interesting tree. This is a very famous tree from Louis Nell. And he actually was making his own containers in his own pots. And this particular pot um, warped in the, in the firing. Um, but what he found is that it actually matched this tree really, really beautifully. And so um, just serendipity allowed him to, to create the right pot for, for this tree. Um, and that was one of the things that the piece Chan uh, often well, said when he was visiting um, South Africa um, many years ago, 1990s. Um, he said, you know, the real beauty in the pots are the incidentals. And, and that is certainly true. You know, the way in which the pot has, you know, has, has changed in the firing or, or has some kind of character. Um, I think one of the big challenges is that um, most of the aesthetics for um, bonsai pots have been developed in the East and suitable for species that grow in the East. And this is, you know, South African trees sometimes need different growing conditions. And so the perfect pot match for many South African trees isn't actually the best horticultural match. And I think this is what makes it quite challenging for um, bonsai groves in South Africa using indigenous material. So this is an example of, a, of an acacia tree um, that I've had, uh, that I got from Ken, and it's a tree that was grown from seed in Kirstenbosch uh, from the 1940s. And you can see in, when Ken had it, he was trying to keep it in this very, 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 very shallow Japanese pot. And aesthetically, it was, it was dramatic and interesting, um, but health-wise, the tree really just didn't, um, uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't that happy. And so um, uh, this, you know, with acacias, they actually like a fair amount of water and they like their, their roots to go fairly deep. And so for me, it was, it was a big challenge to actually get the tree to, to match a decent pot. Um, and then eventually I managed to, to get it into this drum pot. Um, it's a little bit heavier than, than one would aesthetically be ideal. Um, but it, it, it matches well and the, the tree actually can grow properly. And so primarily you want the tree to grow properly, but then you want the, the aesthetics as well. Uh, another, just an interesting tree randomly chose off, chosen off the internet. I think it's a really striking tree. And again, matching with a very interesting um, container. Very simple, very elegant, very understated, um, but it's the kind of container that, that you want to actually match with a, with a tree like this. So, um, this section is very much for Earl, um, but I see that Earl, I don't think he's actually on the call, um, but hopefully you'll watch it. So the browns and, and, and you know, talking about brown bonsai pots and, and what you get with brown bonsai pots. And I think what, what I'm wanting to do here is I want to um, show the way in which um, uh, you get different grades of pots and different quality. And so if we look at this pot here, uh, it's 270 Rand. And to, to actually help people to sort of conceptualize, you know, what this actually means, I've, I've put in different cars that you can get from the absolute entry level, cheapest car in the country, 153,000 Rand um, for a Suzuki. And, um, you know, what, what you get is just a very basic model, something that, that will keep your tree alive and, you know, is a nice dark brown color and, and looks reasonable. Nothing flashy, nothing fancy, but just, just very practical and very basic. Um, if you go for something better, mid-level, um, then you end up with a much more attractive car. It's got many more features and, and characters. And by the same token, you look at a, a bonsai pot like this, 
um, also from bonsai tree and um, much more refined, much more beautiful. The edges are, are finished. It is a handmade pot. So, um, you know, it just has character and beauty that the other pot didn't have. And um, also the quality of the clay is improved. Um, you can then get a, you know, a much better pot. This is um, a pot called Nakano Gyozan. He's currently Japan's number one potter. And so he's commissioned frequently to produce pots for Kokofu exhibition trees and things like that. And so this is, you know, really a very beautiful pot, very good quality pot, you know, kind of almost like a, a Mercedes S-Class for two million rand. Um, but in this particular case, it's 17,000 rand. Um, but you can see, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pot that's got much more class, much more character, um, will age more beautifully. Um, but interesting, you know, just to look at the simplicity. So you are also buying the brand. You're also buying the fact that um, Yezon pots are rare. Um, they're all handmade and they're very, very desirable in Japan. Um, we then get to the, you know, the much more desirable pots, and this is uh, Tofukuji pots. Um, he's the most collectible and most famous um, potter in Japan, um, passed away in the 19, late 1970s, I think. Um, and he was groundbreaking in the kinds of pots that he created, the way he, he, he you know, the aesthetic. I mean, he's, he's the epitome or the pinnacle of bonsai pot aesthetics in Japan. And so generally they're quite small. This is a shown sized pot. It's about um, probably about 12 to 15 centimeters across and uh, 62,000 grand, um, but an exquisitely beautiful pot and extremely collectible. And so not only are you paying for the aesthetics and the quality, but you're also now paying for, for the brand and for the, um, for the person that made it. And so, you know, we really are moving into, into art. Um, and then you get the um, extremely ancient pots. This is on eBay at the moment for 79,000 Rand. Um, uh, Nakawatari means that it's um, first crossing. So it's a very early um, Chinese pot that was, that was taken across to Japan. Um, it's a known uh, potter. And so it's just a very desirable, very aesthetically beautiful and aged container. Um, somewhat similar to this absolutely classic car that sold for 171 million rand. Um, and so, you know, you can see that, that you know, you, you do just, to a large extent get what you pay for. And, um, you know, that, that first pot that we had is perfectly functional. It'll keep your tree alive, but it really won't enhance the aesthetics of the, of the bonsai that, that you're trying to present. And so as your trees get better, we really do need to start looking for, for better and better pots. And even if they're going to be brown pots, you can still get very, very beautiful brown bonsai containers. Um, if we look at some of the glazed containers, again, you know, the entry level Japanese containers, um, they very harsh. The glazes are extremely refined. They're extremely shiny. Um, they're very, very hard glazes. They don't change in any kind of way when you use them for, for years and years and years. And they never develop a, a patina. Um, but, you know, from a functional point of view, from a a horticultural point of view, your bonsai will grow quite happily in pots like this. But just from the aesthetic, as your tree matures and it ages, um, the character of the tree will start, you know, the, 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 the cheapness of the pot and the glossiness and the shininess of the pot will detract from the age and the character and the presence that your, that your tree will be developing. So, you know, you can get a better quality pot. Now, all of these are blue glazed pots and you can see the difference. You know, here you've got these very highly refined, very harsh glazes. Uh, this is a pot called Yamafusa and um, also available from, uh, from Bonsai Tree. And you can see how the glaze has got much more complexity in it. it in it, it's much deeper, it's much more um, characterful. And, you know, the, the maturity of the tree and the, the sort of the stability and the um, Japanese aesthetics of Wabi, Sabi, Shibui, Yugen, all of those things are coming out in a, in a container like this. Um, and then we go back to Tofukuji pots and one of his big things was amazingly in innovative glazes. And these are just examples of some of the, the blue glazed pots of his. And um, you can see the character and the depth. And, you know, apparently they're not even... Um, you know, just, just by photographs, um, uh, don't, don't do them justice. They, they really are just absolutely exquisite, um, exquisite containers. 
Um, I've managed to, you know, at that uh, Bonsai Europa, there was a, a Tofuguji pot for sale. Um, I had a look at it, gently picked it up and put it down. But, uh, you know, this is the sort of the ultimate goal is to is to actually try and get one of these pots to add to my collection. Um, and then you also get the very high end um, uh, painted pots um, and, you know, this really exquisite painting on the ceramics. Um, I've never really got terribly into these kinds of pots, um, you know, adding, matching them to trees is, is difficult. They are showing pots, they're small pots. And so if you've got pretty little trees um, with age and character, um, these kind of pots really do enhance them beautifully. And, and they make a very, very nice sort of offset um, pot on a, on a group display where you might have some heavy brown, you know, uh, unglazed brown pots and some glazed pots, and then these just add a, a lightness to the display. Um, and, and very collectible and, you know, to get pots of the, with this kind of quality of painting um, is, is really very, um, very special. Um, so let's look at some of the pots, some of my pots that I've got. Um, I've always had a, a passion for, for the bonsai pots right from the, the first bonsai meeting that I went to. Um, Ken Doble, you know, at age 15, well, I, I was 15, went to this uh, workshop with Ken and Oyama had just received a, a shipment of Japanese bonsai pots um, from Johannesburg via Shibui. And um, uh, he, you know, I had a rather dreadful tree there, but uh, uh, Ken took one of these pots out of the, the Oyama stock and, and matched it or put it with the tree. And, and from then on, you know, I've just had this passion for pots and, and, you know, what I'm hoping to try and do with this presentation is, is get, you know, just, just convey some of the excitement and some of the pleasure that, that owning good quality bonsai pots brings to me. And, and you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's an area where in South Africa we can definitely improve. Um, so this is a, a queer pot um, that I brought in directly from Japan. Um, it is cast, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a molded pot, but then the, the glazing is, is hand glazed. And, you know, just matching it with a juniper like this, it's a reasonably interesting juniper, but it's not anything particular spectac particularly spectacular. But, um, you know, now with that pot, it just really, you know, brightens the tree up, makes it, makes it much more punchy and much more uh, interesting. Um, Suiban, one of my other weaknesses, um, very difficult to get hold of in, in South Africa. Uh, Suiban is direct translation is water basin, so it's a very broad container um, that doesn't have any holes in it. And um, it's used for displaying stones and rock plantings. Um, so you can draw sand, or combination in this case, and, um, and you can see you know, how it actually enhances the enhances the tree. And I've, I've now got, um, you know, I've got a, um, I've, I've got a, a good collection of them now. I think I've got five or six different sweet buns, glazed, unglazed, uh, bigger and cooler. So that, that's very much a, a sort of a, an interest of mine. Um, this is the sort of the Chinese equivalent of sweet bun, that, uh, that just a Penjing tray. Uh, these trays were made by Brett Simon some years ago, um, beautifully made, very, you know, really, really good um, pots there. They were made from Caesar stone, off cuts of Caesar stone, and uh, really lovely, but unfortunately he stopped making them. It just was too much labor to, to actually get them made up. But, uh, but, you know, the few people that are lucky enough to have some of these, they really are an asset to, to a bonsai collection. Um, a Yamaki pot so made in Japan, made in um, the Tokonoma region of Japan. Um, very nice container, very nice pot, but unfortunately I went over a speed bump a bit too fast with the pot in the back of the car and it smashed into about 16 pieces. I haven't actually been able to, it wasn't repairable. Um, so again, you know, now that I'm starting to get more and more precious and more interesting pots, I have to be more and more careful with my driving and transporting. Um, we do have some interesting locally produced pots. This is a pot by Brenda, my wife. And, uh, you know, these shells and these um, moon pots can actually really be very interesting uh, with one side. And then you also have the, um, uh, the accent plants or cosmono uh, pots, which um, was quite fun, again, made by, by Brenda. 
Um, so we look at the wisteria, my wisteria, and, and the way in which the pot has evolved. Um, this was the first pot that I put it with. Um, it's a Korean pot, uh, very harsh, very sharp edges. You can see on the pot, um, again, the tree grew very nicely in it. Um, but the tree is looking young, the pot is looking young. There just isn't a, a maturity on it. At that time, you know, 2001, it was super exciting to have a, a tree with this kind of flowering on it. So it really was um, quite lovely. But um, but the uh, um, but now in retrospect, you can see how um, yeah how harsh it's actually looking and how unmatched the pot is. I then subsequently managed to get an, a better quality Chinese pot, uh, oval shape, you know, matching the tree. You can see the way in which the tree has matured um, and the pot has a, has a much more mature aesthetic with it as well. And then we move on to um, 2017. This is a buxy pot. What I love about this pot is that it's got a slight sort of purplish um, color in it and um, a slight purple color. Uh, which then brings out the flowers in the um, uh, on the tree, and it's also what I like about the matching is it's got that South African heritage and the South African history. So the so this overall display is entirely South African. It's a South African stand, a South African pot, a wisteria which is Chinese but the, had been grown in South Africa, and and I think the the maturity and the character is is coming in on this tree now. Um, and that, that's the, the sort of the aesthetic pleasure that, that I get from matching. Um, another example of a tree, this is um, my upright cascade um, deodar cedar, which was then put into a very smooth, very shiny um, Japanese pot. It's a, it's a good quality pot, you know, very nicely hand finished. Um, and that was what the tree looked like um, at some stage, a bit later, a couple of years later. Um, what's that now, in 2006. Um, but then the problem was aesthetically, or sorry, you know, horticulturally, this tree wasn't working because the um, bottom region of the tree was actually just dying off. It just didn't like going down. So I changed the angle of the tree and redesigned it completely. Um, and you can see this is what the tree looked like. It's in a um, hand-finished um, Chinese pot. And again, you know, horticulturally working, but a very strong pot, very bold for, for the tree. And what I've done now is I've put it into um, uh, a new pot from, a handmade pot from Japan, um, a, a pot called Bunzan. Um, and, you know, I think the, the drama of the tree matches the drama of the pot quite nicely. What I have found with Bunzan pots, and you can see here, is that it's, it's brand new at, the, at this stage when this photograph's taken. So it's very, very shiny. But the other Bunzan pots that I've been using outside, um, within five to 10 years, that, that shine starts um, disappearing and we start getting patina on this, on this pot. And that's the other big difference that I've found is that um, the good quality Japanese pots develop patina over um, a couple of years, whereas the cheaper quality Japanese pots are so hard, they, they just don't develop any kind of age and character on them. Um, even, you know, I've got some that have been used for 40 years continuously and they still don't have any appreciable aging on the pot. And so as time goes by, as this tree matures, um, I'll, you know, the pot will actually mature with, with the tree. Um, my Chinese maple, again, you know, at this stage, um, that was the only pot that I had available for it. It kind of went well, you know, everybody oohed and odd and said it was a beautiful tree and, you know, how lovely it was. Um, but the pot was just too heavy and too deep and you know, too gray really for, for this tree. Um, I then managed to get this Chinese pot, which um, I think again had, had a bit of a, a character and a, a sort of finesse to it, um, which enhanced the tree. And then I actually had this um, Yamafusa pot made up um, in Japan and it was shipped out to me. And, and I think then I finally did get the decent, um, the decent, the decent matching. Um, with the tree and, and, you know, very classical kind of image on this tree. Again, what's interesting with this pot is that this is a photograph that was taken in um, about 2016, um, and the pot is very white and very shiny. Um, but now, 2021, so we're looking five years later, um, the pot is already beginning to age. It's beginning to yellow slightly. Some of the pots that, that haven't got trees in them at the moment, uh, this is Bunzan. Bunzan is a potter that I particularly enjoy and I've bought quite a few of their pots or his pots um, from Japan. Um, they're just amazing, dramatic, 
chunky glazes that are pot, put onto the pots. The pots themselves are very simply shaped, um, but they just have these incredibly bold, dramatic, weird glazes on them. And uh, the other thing that he often glazes the underneath of his pot. And so, you know, you get this really nice character on the, on the bottom of the pot. Um, and, and the other thing that, that Bunzan sometimes does is he actually fires his pots upside down. And so the, the glazes, the drips on the glazes go up towards the rim rather than down towards the feet. And, and it creates a, a very beautiful um, effect on, on some of his pots. So you can see in the bottom left-hand corner the way in which that glaze has dripped down onto the, the lower parts of the pot and really quite dramatic. Um, obviously, it needs to be a very strong, very dramatic, very showy kind of tree to be able to handle a pot like this, um, but it'll certainly be considerably more exciting to have a tree in, in a pot like this rather than a, a brown oval. Uh, this is that Yamafusa pot, which I um, had made up in Japan, um, and you can see how it was very shiny and very white when it was new, and, and it is aging over time. Um, a new potter that I've just actually discovered, um, a pot that I've only discovered it now, but uh, uh, Imoka Machinao, um, it always strikes me as being quite an Italian kind of name, but anyway, um, he was born in 1925 um, and he started making pots in 1964 and ran into sort of the, the late 1970s, um, produced a tremendous number of pots, uh, produced a book on how to produce, how to um, manufacture and make uh, small shown bonsai pots. Um, all of his pots are, are shown sized small pots, produced huge numbers of them. Um, but what he did, he had a very, very significant impact on all the contemporary potters that are, that are actually making pots nowadays. Um, and as a result of that, his pots have become highly collectible. Um, and so there's, there's a very vigorous trade in Japan, um, you know, for his pots. And on eBay about a month ago, month and a half ago, I found these two pots being sold by somebody in America. Um, and I ended up buying them. They were um, probably about 60% uh, of the price of what you pay in Japan. Um, so it was, you know, it was worth buying them. What I, what I absolutely adore about um, uh, this left-hand pot, this, this rectangular pot, is the way in which the outside is rectangular, but the inside is almost oval. Um, I just think that, that that shape of that lip is, is absolutely beautiful. Um, it is a very small pot. It's only about um, 10 centimeters across. So I don't know what tree I'll put into it, but it, it's just also, you know, actually having that name, having, the collect, you know, having a very collectible pot in my collection. Um, second generation Yamaki is the most famous of the Yamaki potters. It was a family that of three generations of potters, and uh, this was the, the, the high, most highly regarded of the, of the potters. And what I enjoy about this pot is that it has the so-called thunder border um, stamp on the bottom, which is the stamp of the head of the kiln. And, and I haven't actually seen many of those pots for sale. They, they are around, um, but um, you know, I was quite excited to, to actually get hold of the spot. Um, again, you know, brown rectangle, but the quality of the clay, the character in the clay, they, they've got depth. They, they don't have a smoothness to them that you get from the, the cheaper pots. Uh, Big A is another very famous potter, um, very collectible in the West. Lots and lots of people are buying them. Um, he's particularly famous for the nail carving. Um, so that, you know, this, very, um, this very smooth, extremely refined clay that he then does the, the carvings in. So, you know, the, the top pot and the bottom pot are examples, or very nice examples of his nail carving. Um, and both of them were bought from Japan. And then I was quite interested to get hold of that green pot because that was also by Bigay. Um, but he, you know, it's, it's very unusual to have a glazed pot of his and also an extremely rough and groggy clay. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just a very unusual work by this, by this particular potter. Uh, Gearzan, I have managed to get two Gearzan pots into my collection. Uh, this one I bought from Terry Rasmus. Um, bonsai tree and um, what you can see is again the patina that's developed on it so it's you know a pot that's got some age in it and again you know yes so it's just a you know a sort of squarish oval shaped pot 
but um, the aesthetic of it is just so much more attractive than the, the more mass produced pots. So you look at the walls and the way in which there's that slight curvature outwards, the quality and the finish of the rim, that ridge that you've got at the bottom that's catching uh, patina. It's just all around, you know, the, the, the quality of the finish and the quality of the design just makes the pot just so much more attractive um, to me than the, the cheap pots. So it is a brown pot, but, uh, but it's just a, a really nice brown pot. Uh, eco pots, I, I have quite, um, these, these two pots I was quite excited to get hold of again because they um, were on sale for half the price of the, you know, what you pay in Japan. And so, you know, I quite luckily get hold of these two. Don't quite know what trees I'm going to plant into them, but, um, you know, the, the, just getting this particular potter, again, very collectible, very desirable potter. And, uh, and I managed to get them for cheap prices. Um, the one at the bottom was bought from the same person that sold those two um, uh, Machao pots. And um, both or three of those pots are currently sitting in America and I'm not quite sure how we're going to get them to South Africa, but uh, they'll, they'll be coming in at some stage. Um, then we get on to this uh, final Begay pot and, um, uh, you know, looking at it from the front, it looks kind of intriguing, kind of weird. It's a very small pot. You can see it's only about an inch in diameter, um, but, but a very interesting pot. And the fun thing about this pot is if you look at the bottom of the pot, it's a little, it's a little um, devil. They, they're called Oni um, in, in Japan. And uh, this is one of the sort of the um, iconic pots that Begay produces. I don't, I don't know how many he's produced, quite a few, but they are very much handmade, hand carved um, at a very, very small scale. When you look at the size of them, they're tiny little pots, um, but just with this exquisite detail. And those two feet that you can see there are the two horns of the, of the Oni at the bottom and then his bottom lip is the is the third foot and um what i just love about this pot is that um it's just the surprise you know it's this you know if i was using it as a bonsai pot most viewers just wouldn't see this the, the character in this um you know what's happening with this pot it's just this hidden this hidden gem um and so you know this is the, the kind of the excitement that i have um when you know when getting the the better quality um of pots um, yeah, Toller, I do agree. I mean, people can produce them, but I think, I think the, it's the, the cultural significance of it as well. Um, you know, certainly, you know, I mean, we could look at, at other cultural icons in South Africa and, um, and recreate those. Uh, so really just, just in conclusion then, the, you know, I think, I think it's as, as our bonsai develops and as, as we progress with our bonsai, um, we really need to start looking at aspects of attention to detail and really to, to enhance them and make them look the very best that they can. And, you know, this was um, Jean-Paul Polman's um, at the Bonsai Europe in 2017. And just the quality of this display is really quite astounding. Um, it's, a, it's a white pot that's got very strong, very deep uh, pattern on it. So it's an old white pot. is matched with a very old beautiful um uh it's a it's a really beautifully made stand um and then you know you've got all of these combinations of shiny and dull and very highly refined and and so i think this is a you know kind of a an inspiration that we that we can draw from um often the discussion you know amongst sort of people that i talk to is is the way in which our trees maybe aren't quite as highly refined as the japanese trees and so you know, being displayed on a stand like this might be a bit, um, you know, a bit contrasty, a bit, bit sort of jarring because our trees are, are still much coarser. They're not as highly refined. Um, and I think that is true, but it, it certainly should give us pause for thought around how we, we make use of the ruggedness of our trees and, and actually create displays that, that enhance that ruggedness and then show off that tree. Um, you know, and actually look at the, the attention to detail on the display and don't just kind of stick it into a pot because you've got the pot and it's a brown pot and brown pots work and then stick it onto the show table and, you know, say, this is my tree. Um, you know, I think actually some reflection and thought about the process of the potting, the, the beauty of the pot, the beauty of the stand, the beauty of the display is a, is a very important um, 
Okay, so that's me and my pots and the way in which I just love pots. I love collecting pots. I, yeah, um, it really is a passion. I don't know, hopefully some of that passion has actually been conveyed. And uh, if there's any questions or anything, I think then we can, we can actually answer them. So um, yeah, thanks very much, everybody.